Welcome to the Times Arrow Podcast. I'm your host, Alan Guy Wilcox. We are here today with staff writer Lindsay Dolan, who has just penned a new introduction for J.D. Salinger's important 1961 work, Franny and Zoe. Welcome, Lindsay. Thank you. I'm excited to speak about it. Tell us a little bit about this work and what makes it unique, why you're drawn to it. And um, in your in your piece, you talk a lot about the flavor and the shadow that it casts on I don't know, contemporary sensibility. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I think it's really unique because like it um, do, it's not doesn't feel like a self-contained like narrative in itself. The first part is more um, more so. It's like kind of a straightforward story about the character Franny, who is a member of the Glass family, one of Salinger's. Like he has the Caulfield family and the Glass family in his body of work, and um, so the Glasses are like a fixation of a number of his stories. So Franny is visiting her boyfriend Lane for a lunch and to go see a football game, but she's really her life has been kind of derailed by discovering this Eastern philo- philosophical like Christian text, um, the Way of the Pilgrim. So she's kind of having like a spiritual breakdown in the middle of this dinner, and then um, the second story switches to Zoe, her brother, another member of the Glass family, and it's kind of switches from like a, a like worldly narrative story to um, kind of a monologue um, letter component by Zoe and her brothers, like kind of consoling her and trying to help her through her spiritual crisis. Can you? Tell us a little bit, like zoom out a little bit and tell us a little bit about the Glass family generally, because what you're expressing is um, that especially, you know, Franny's going through this, for lack of a better term, existential crisis, and that's not uncommon to her family. Yeah, exactly. Um, One thing that Zoe says throughout the book is that each member of the family gets their religion in a different package. So they're all kind of these like spiritually starved people and it's a family of uh, seven siblings their parents were vaudeville performers and each of them were like was like a child genius they appeared on the show it's a wise child so um, from the very beginning they've kind of cemented their image as this like very extremely exceedingly wise precocious um, group of seven children so they've carried that throughout their lives and um, it kind of makes them like hunger for more spiritually and intellectually and they feel very other from everyone around them. The two um, oldest siblings, um, Seymour and Buddy, they were really interested in Eastern philosophy in particular, um, kind of mirroring like Salinger's interest in Vedanta Buddhism. So they took it upon themselves to kind of instruct the younger siblings, uh, namely Franny and Zoe, in in this kind of way of thinking like Zen, everything. So um, yeah, that's been their foundation as a family. It seems like it, it's interesting, and it's not surprising that a family that would be well known, that had spent time on uh, TV, Zoe is a even a, an actor on TV, um, and, and that had a rich and robust intellectual life and a performative life, are searching for you know knowledge and wisdom outside their normal ken. Um, but that there's not necessarily outside the family a cultural reinforcement. Certainly when we look to a boyfriend like Lane, there's not a, there's not kind of a cultural um, undergirding for, for the Eastern philosophy. So it can, it can lead to some unsettling personal moments. No, or how, how do you read that? Yeah, exactly. I think that's kind of like the foundation of um, kind of their their depression, uh, Franny's existential crisis, that there is no like foundational undergirding of this Eastern philosophy in like the Western world. There's kind of a, a huge dissonance. I think that um, mirrors how like Salinger kind of felt um, upset with like the the fascination, the publicity around like publishing and everything. He needed to turn to something else. So um, and like spiritualism was where he found it. Okay, so that's quite interesting and and brings up another aspect of the conversation that I hope to launch into, which is Salinger's life and career in particular. But as we're kind of making that turn, I wanted to ask what it sounds like is this also interfaces with The Catcher in the Rye, the book that 
if anyone knows Salinger at all, that they will know that novel. Uh, but there's a there's a concern, an abiding interest in delineating between what is authentic and what is phony in that book for Holden. And that also that theme is also resonant and stitched right into the fabric of this book, is it not? Definitely. I think Franny and Holden are very similar characters. They're also said to be like two of the characters that um, Salinger related to most heavily. They're like projections of himself. Um, like Franny describes things as phony herself. That word crops up a lot in Franny and Zoe. Um, yeah, I had just reread Catcher in the Rye actually, and it's it's very tonally similar. They kind of project the same kind of um, like dissatisfaction with the same kind of people doing things for phony reasons. Um, like it, I think it all comes down to um, maybe Salinger wasn't as interested in like Buddhism or spirituality when he was writing Catcher in the Rye, but I think um, he was able to put a word to some of Holden's dissatisfaction with Fran Franny and Zoe with like diagnosing ego as the problem with everything around them. Mm, that's great. You just used the word uh, tonally, which I think is such an important word to think about in, in Salinger's work because so much of it is built on these delineations of tone. And one of the things that, in, in my experience, made both of these texts so palatable is because, you know, we, we see in the, in the opening story, Franny, that Lane receives a, he's rereading almost compulsively a letter that she had written and that letter is almost immediately we see kind of an earlier version of her, an earlier representation, a kind of, you know, she uses the word love so many times. She's kind of expressing something. She's projecting something out there. But it's also filled with um, co self-contradictory things and the aspiration, uh, this kind of intellectual aspiration and also misspellings. And so Salinger seems to be gently winking at us. This is also true, you compared Franny and Holden, which I think I hadn't thought of that, and it makes a lot of sense to hear you say it. Their, their contradictions are kind of lovingly um, packaged so that, yes, they are reaching for something more. Yes, they are delineating between what's phony and what's authentic, but they also express this jumble in their own persona. Um, Okay, so let's let's just let me ask you a few questions because you've also recently um, r read a, a biography of Sounders. That that's true, right? Yeah, I read um, David Shields' 2013 one. It was very interesting. So maybe you could use that to just just to begin this portion of the conversation to frame out a little bit, you know, how this book, Franny and Zoe, fits into. Salinger's career, but also kind of where was Salinger the, the man at this point in his life and career? Yeah, it's really interesting how um, his, his personal life kind of is very clearly reflected in Franny and Zoe, um, even structurally. So um, Catcher in the Rye had been published a decade before. He had also published uh, nine stories, like the collection of short stories that were largely published in The New Yorker. But um, so after the publicity of Catcher in the Rye, he kind of receded into religion, Vedanta Buddhism, and um, there are four kind of stages of Vedanta Buddhism. The first is apprenticeship, so he was like learning about everything. Um, second is marriage and starting a family. So Franny was actually written uh, the manuscript as a gift for his fiancée Claire. Um, Franny was based off of her like archetypically and um, he was still, he was like more in the world at that point still. That was like the stage he was at. And the third stage is um, like, you're beginning to withdraw from the world. So Franny and Zoe were written a couple years apart with Franny who was still still in that second stage, like being of the world, having a family involved with people and everything. And it's, it's reflected in the structure of the work. It's more worldly. Um, it takes more of a, like a narrative shape instead of like plainly introspective where, where Zoe is a couple years later. Um, so in this withdrawal stage, it's very evident that um, he, he, you can see him, the narrative voice kind of like withdrawing into himself. It's more, more introspective, more of like a monologue and just musings on religion, life, like answers to Zoe, which, uh, Franny, which he'd previously written a couple years before. Um, 
yeah, so it's kind of like you can see structurally his life, religion reflected into these two stories. That's fascinating and, and somewhat, well, alarming is the, r- the wrong word, of course, but um, it's, it's telling that we think of Salinger uh, as a kind of reclusive figure in American letters, not one to ever really provide interviews, um, someone who especially kind of pointed because The Catcher in the Rye is such a, a perennial bestseller for the past half a century, and but we, we know so little about the inner life of the, the artist himself and, and, and on purpose, because to use your word, he, he, he really has withdrawn. So, so are we meant to think that it's really that he took this third phase of, of this Buddhist practice quite seriously in, in kind of an accelerating a, a withdrawal from, from, from public life? Yeah, I think definitely. Um, I think he, well, uh, the biography I read kind of argues that it was it was also a way that he latched onto to as a way of like controlling the narrative around him. So he he was withdrawn, but he was still very active um, in like combating you know things certain things that were would have been written about him, certain like efforts to publish more like without his consent. Um, he was very active in like controlling his image in the world. Um, even from this withdrawn standpoint. Okay, that, that's interesting, this idea of Salinger's image in the world. Can you, Lindsay, can you talk a little bit about both, you know, how you find the reading experience of Franny and Zoe today, in today's world, and then, um, you know, speaking of Salinger's image, like where else do we see Salinger's aesthetic at play. One thing that just came to mind that I wanted to mention, which I hadn't thought of before, but um, with the Glass family having appeared on this kind of quiz show, is it is it brought to mind um, Paul Thomas Anderson's film uh, Magnolia, in which one of the characters is kind of a a survivor of the the quiz show circuit uh, as a kid. So where else do we see Salinger's uh, shadow casting? Uh, yeah, he's like a lot of contemporary writers, filmmakers take inspiration from him. I think he has like a very rich um, imagery as well that, um, you know, a lot to take inspiration from. He describes like uh, fur coats in like lush detail and just his image of New York City is kind of very inspirational for writers. Um, like I actually came to Franny and Zoe after reading or listening to an interview with Sally Rooney, like the Irish author, and she was just saying how much that influenced her. And you can really see it in um, conversations with friends. Her first novel, like there's there's Francis and um, Nick is an older actor, an ex quiz show veteran kind of. So it's I think he mostly crops up like um, in these kind of character archetypes that he's created. You know, that's quite powerful. So it's more than just a stylistic impression, right? When we when we think of writers like you know Hemingway or Faulkner, whose stylistic um, modalities were hugely influential. Uh, we see that with Salinger, it's not only the kind of surface level style, uh, the coats and the jackets and the breezy nature, but it, but it's also the, the archetypal. It's, it's how characters relate to one another, how they move through the world on a deep level that is being, um, I want to say, mimicked but you know um in, in, a, in a kind of loving uh way in, in in these other works yeah i think when um like when genuine inspiration is taken from him that's what that's what tends to like be seen in it um it's like his style is known to be apparently like easy or pretty easy to imitate um someone published uh like during the 50s or 60s something purporting to be written by him when there was like a, a huge dearth of uh, Salinger works when he'd already withdrawn. And so it was it was um, published anonymously, but you know, the style was, he calls like, you know, he's very loose with language, calling characters like old, Bessie old, uh, using like goddamn so much, like you can very easily like kind of purport to be him by just using those indicators. So he, 
he, he yeah in his fashion of like controlling the narrative around him he like litigated against that but yeah that's interesting it reminds me just anecdotally of um cervantes had published what well, you know what was then the only installment in don quixote and then um several years later uh because nothing else had come out no part two had come out an imitator wrote a very you know poor uh imitation and so it it um inspired allegedly Cervantes to come out at, w with, with a, a part two and really make a definitive statement. I wonder if that was in Salinger's mind at all. Um, why would we go to this book now outside of being assigned it? What, what do we get from it? Yeah, I think like you mentioned, like everyone reads Catcher in the Rye first pretty much. And, but that's often like seen even culturally as like a, a juvenile work, like something you read in high school. Franny and Zoe, I think cements like the coming of age, his coming of age style into like a, a more mature setting, like their uh, friends in college, Zoe's in like 25, like as a working actor, like, but they're still having these same feelings of otherness. They're still having these same like crises as uh, like kind of mutated, evolved from Catcher in the Rye's. So I think it it's like you read Catcher in the Rye, um, if you're feeling like m misunderstood, you might empathize with Holden very heavily, but I think Franny and Zoe like allows that, allows you to, to be seen in that way even Beyond, beyond high school, beyond your teen years, you know? As we kind of, um, you know, conclude our conversation on Franny and Zoe, Lindsay, I, I'm wondering what felt to you most distinctly different from today about the world in which Salinger is writing? That's interesting, because I, I, I felt a lot more like, definitely a lot more similarities, a lot of things that made me think like he, he it feels ahead of its time for like you know this era of literature like the, just the way that his characters like the the dialogue no matter how sincere like their convictions are their the style like the way he writes tonally coming through even in, with text sounds very like glib and flippant sometimes like they're very there's a huge distance between like the way you can hear their voices and um the substance of it so it feels like a kind of extremely contemporary kind of ironic humor in his dialogue i thought that was um that's probably the like the biggest thing that grabbed me. Just to, to to put a button on this, you also mentioned nine stories, and there's obviously a very important story in that collection that relates to the body of work we've been talking about. If someone wants to read Franny and Zoe, but also have a, a deeper sense for the Glass family, what else should they make sure to include in their in their reading program? Yeah, um, I think um, hmm. in Nine Stories, there's a lot about the glasses. There's um, or there's like a larger thread of like his Salinger's bit onto philosophy throughout. Like the the final story, Teddy, it's like a young child who kind of mirrors the the savant, like the precociousness of of the Glass family. He's like musing on a lot of these principles, but. Um, after after Franny and Zoe, like his last Salinger's last like published cohesive work was um, Raise High the Roof Beam Carpenters and Seymour Introduction, and Seymour Introduction takes you like way more way more into the character of Seymour, who's like, um, well, Mister Glass is, isn't really seen in any of these stories, so he's kind of almost the patriarch of the family. He's the oldest son. He um, well, his like suicide kind of overshadows a lot of the works in. Um, in in the Glass family collection, um, which is yeah, a perfect day for Banana Fish was the one um, which details that. But a Seymour introduction is also it's it's like known for kind of devolving further from like Zoe. Zoe was notably more more introspective, more meandering than Franny in a lot of his more structured narratives. Like uh, Seymour and introduction follows that even more to the point of where it was like it was not well received it was seen as Salinger like completing his withdrawal into like writing for an audience of one almost so it feels very it's a little more it's a little maybe less like rewarding to read but it, it digs deeper into the Glass family and see more. I think that points to something that I hadn't even really thought to articulate but seems like uh, a, my kind of long-term impression of Salinger's work in general, and in that there's there's 
so much to delight. There's so much to amuse and entertain. There's so much intellectual richness that we get, frankly, from a lot of um, European novels, and we don't see a lot of in mid-century American fiction, per se, but we do get from Salinger. But then there's also just this kind of minor key, uh, this, this, this note that gets struck um, which feels unsettling. Uh, certainly the topic of suicide is um, a fraught and painful one that has echoes across all the other characters' stories. Um, but yeah, it seems like part of Salinger's artistic temperament to, to leave us not feeling fully resolved. Yeah, I would agree with that. Lindsay, uh, thank you so much uh, for your time and, and for your piece, which is available up on timesarrow.org and we'll probably be releasing um, some more snippets of the text through social media but uh, look forward to speaking with you further about Salinger's work and, and, and what else you're up to uh, very soon yeah thanks for having me talk about it a pleasure okay um, till next time happy reading